Hi everyone. So for this video, I'm going to cover hypertension and hypotension. So on this slide, um, I want to talk about the prevalence of hypertension. Uh, so hypertension is first off the most common reason non-pregnant adults uh, visit the physician's office and the most common reason for the use of prescription drugs. Okay. And in fact, what you're going to see is that many patients are actually on uh, multiple hypertension medications. Uh, or I should say multiple antihypertensive medications. 46% of adult Americans have hypertension. Okay, so that's nearly half of the adult American population has hypertension. Uh, the prevalence increases with age, which you may suspect, okay, especially considering as we age, we lose the compliance of our, our blood vessels. They become a little bit stiffer and pressures go up. Okay, so uh, the highest prevalence, though, is found to be in non-Hispanic black adults, okay? And only half of people with hypertension are controlled. And that's actually a really important sort of bullet point there, is that uh, this can be very difficult to treat, and there's multiple reasons for that. Some of it has to do with the complexity of, of what might be causing the, the hypertension in the first place, and uh, because it's not always very direct. And other times it may have to do with say patient education and compliance. And just to give you an example, uh, uh, if you have um, a patient who comes in with severe throbbing headaches, okay, they're getting migraines headaches, and you give them medication, they're more likely to be compliant with that because they have a severe symptom that they want to go away, right? So they'll follow through usually with the medication or take it uh, as often as needed to keep the, the headaches from, from coming back. However, with hypertension, uh, as we will discuss a little bit more in detail later, these patients don't always have symptoms. It's common that they don't have symptoms for the most part, unless it's a very severe sort of late stage or they're having you know, hypertensive crisis or emergencies. So without the symptoms, they may have to take some of these medications indefinitely, and so compliance can become an issue, and this is where our job as you know, uh, educators has to, has to really uh, come to the forefront to make sure that we, we stay on top of them. Okay, and so that they understand. Now, if we look at this this chart to the right here, this is actually from the American Heart Association, uh, which they actually took this from the um, Journal of Hypertension. Now, um, if we look at this, what it's t what it's showing you is men versus women, the top there. Okay, and it's saying that the we're categorizing hypertension as anything greater than 130 over 80, and I'll talk about the different. Um, uh, the different levels of, of hypertension in, in, to, uh, in the next few slides. But, uh, you know, just a few things to show you here. So here's, you know, men over here, all right, and then the women. So that's just the end is just the number uh, of patients in each group. And they, they broke it down by age group, which you can see over here. So 20 to 44, 45, 54, and so on. And you'll see the trend, though, as we go from younger to older. Yeah, you notice a, a sharp increase. We're not a sharp increase, but you, should, you do see an increase um, in the prevalence, okay, in the population there. You see the same thing with uh, females, but in general, females for most of those age categories uh, have a smaller percentage of them who have hypertensive relative to the males, except once we get over the age of 75, they've noticed that there's a, a, an increase in females over males at that point. If we take a, if they when they took a look at the breakdown of the you know race and ethnicity and who is most affected, you'll see here the non-Hispanic blacks, okay, both men and women, had the highest overall. Okay, so these are things that we need to pay attention to. This is, um, you know, research that's going to help us make sure we reach out to these patients and uh, treat them accordingly. Okay, so let's discuss blood pressure. I just want to review blood pressure um, quickly with you. So we generally, when we take a blood pressure, we're usually referring to the arterial pressure in the systemic circulation. Now understand there will be circumstances uh, clinically where we might want to take a, a venous blood pressure uh, or we might want to take you know, pulmonary pressures and that would give us you know, other information as necessary for the clinical scenario. But in general, when you go to a clinic or into the hospital, uh, the most common blood pressure that we'll be taking will be the arterial blood pressure, okay? usually measured at the brachial artery, so they usually use a cuff on the arm, right? Now, the systolic and diastolic blood pressures, just as a review, 120 over 80 is a sort of a, our common go-to blood pressure, right? So this is less than 120 over 80 is, is, a, is a good blood pressure. 
So 120 over 80, uh, the top number 120 represents the systolic number, which represents uh, the pressure that's in the arteries when the heart or the, ventric the ventricles of the heart are contracting. Okay, and the diastolic or the lower number, uh, 80 in this case, is actually um, the pressure that's in the arteries while the heart is actually in diastole uh, and relaxed and filling. Okay, and the difference between the top number and the bottom number is referred to as a pulse pressure. All right, and that becomes relevant in certain disease states, which I've reviewed in some of the videos. Now, the factors that influence blood pressure, all right, there's really four main factors is cardiac output, the total peripheral resistance the blood volume, and then in terms of the anatomy, the compliance of the, the vessel wall, as I've already spoke about in the earlier slides, uh, if we lose compliance, the vessels become stiffer. These are the guidelines for blood pressure. So I mentioned 120 over 80. So here, these are as of 2017's guidelines. So this is our normal. Okay, and there's a couple things I want you to kind of pay attention to when it comes to this chart here. Um, is both the, is this, excuse me, is this column right here that says N or or, or it might say and or. So we wanna, wanna keep that in mind. So for example, a normal blood pressure is less than, okay, so this is important, less than 120 and less than 80. That's a normal blood pressure. Now, of course, Less than, you know, that's there's a wide range there. Obviously, if we're dropping below, say, 90 millimeters of mercury systolic, that can make us hypotensive, and that's that's a problem. Um, elevated. All right, so this is sort of a, the where the new categorization takes takes hold, is that 120 over one, 120 to 129 systolic, and so look at it, it's an N there, less than 80. Okay, so in other words, if some patient, uh, if you diagnose them uh, or you've taken their blood pressure and it's 125 over 75, that's considered elevated. And what this means is really we're just going to see if we can intervene at this level. Okay, and this is to hopefully prevent progression of, of hypertension later on. High blood pressure. All right, so now we're talking about stage one. That's 130 to 139 systolic or, so here's where there's an or, so or a diastolic 80 to 89. And so as an example of this, you could have a patient who is 119 systolic over 85. That 85 means that it is now stage one, okay? Other words, I mean, otherwise it could be, you know, 130 over 79, and that would also be stage one. So that's what we mean by the or, okay? Stage two is 140 systolic or higher or it is 90 systolic, uh, diastolic, excuse me, or higher. All right. And then finally, uh, and again, that's a broad range because there's, we can go, go quite high from there, but higher than 180 and or higher than 120. Okay. So at 180 over 120, for example, that would be what we call a hypertensive crisis. And that could be an, an urgency or an emergency. And we'll differentiate that later on in this lecture. Okay, so in this slide, I want to talk about uh, control of blood pressure. So this is a review from physiology to kind of go over the aspects of how blood pressure is regulated. And this is key to understanding both the pathophysiology as well as the way in which we try to treat or approach treatments for hypertensive patients. So as a reminder, I'm going to draw the equation up here so you guys can visualize it. But this is blood pressure is equal to the cardiac output times the total peripheral resistance. And the cardiac output can be broken down into the heart rate times the stroke volume. All right, so that's just to remind you guys of that, that relationship that they have. So in other words, if cardiac output goes up, so does blood pressure. If resistance goes up, so does blood pressure and so on. Okay, so it's directly proportional. Heart rate and stroke volume. So let's start with that first bullet point, heart rate and stroke volume, which make up our cardiac output. All right, can be regulated by our autonomic nervous system. Right, can increase or decrease our heart rate. The stroke volume has a little more complexity to it because there's, it's got uh, uh, other components that can regulate it. So the autonomic nervous system can regulate stroke volume by increasing or decreasing contractility, uh, but that also we also have to take into account uh, the amount of volume, blood volume that there is. 
okay? So an increase in blood volume would also increase the stroke volume, okay? We get a better stretch of the uh, myocytes, and then through the Starling mechanism, we would get a better contraction and a better stroke volume from that. Um, and then, you know, the venous tone. And what I want to mention about the venous tone, so let me just underline this right here, venous tone. Arteries and veins both have uh, adrenergic receptors, and they will respond to catecholamines, okay? And when they do, they'll constrict, they'll vasoconstrict. Primarily, constriction takes place, or the most of the resistance takes place on the arterial side, okay? But on the venous side, when there's, vas when there's venoconstriction, that actually moves venous blood back towards the heart and increases venous return. So venous return is a big component of stroke volume. Okay, so contractility and venous return. The things that are affecting the venous return is going to be the volume and the tone. So if we have contraction of the veins, that'll move the blood back towards the heart. If there's uh, dilatation or they are relaxed, it kind of acts like a reservoir instead and it pools in the veins. The total peripheral resistance, so that's the other half of this blood pressure equation. Things that affect resistance, we know the length of the blood vessels, which is fairly fixed. It doesn't change acutely. Viscosity. The viscosity can change in certain circumstances. It's not common. It doesn't usually, it's not how we regulate pressures moment to moment under normal physiological conditions. But let's say you had an increase in the number of red blood cells. That could increase the thickness of the blood uh, and make it more viscous, and that would increase resistance. Uh, but now primarily, you know, we're going to have things like vasodilation and vasoconstriction, which do change resistances moment to moment. Vasodilation reduces resistance. Uh, vasoconstriction would increase resistance, right? And that can be carried out through uh, activation of, you know, adrenergic receptors, both alpha and beta. Alpha receptors cause constriction and the beta receptors would cause uh, dilation. But smooth muscle cells and endothelial cells um, have this relationship where they can actually interact with a host of different mediators that are in the blood itself, uh, including, you know, the catecholamines released from the adrenal gland, uh, angiotensin 2, um, you know, from the angiotensin 2 pathway. These, these are other mediators that can actually interact with smooth muscle cells, for instance, and cause vasoconstriction or vasodilation. So angiotensin 2, for example, would cause vasoconstriction, uh, whereas um, nitric oxide released more locally, uh, we call it vasodilation, all right? And so these are other media in which we will actually try to approach from a, um, a treatment standpoint. Blood volume. So blood volume is related to the stroke volume for obvious reasons, because if we increase the blood volume, that's going to increase circulating volume and thus our stroke volume as well. And so the hormones that can regulate that volume are the part of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system or that RAS system, okay? Natriuretic peptides, which actually can lower the volumes, right? Like atrial and the um, brain natriuretic peptides. Antidiuretic hormone is another one. So antidiuretic will help to conserve uh, volume, right? And that's actually the job of the RAS system as well is to conserve volume, to keep that volume inside the blood vessels to help maintain blood pressure or, or keep it up, right? Hypothalamus uh, will be help will be needed for triggering our thirst mechanism to maintain our volume because we have to replace what's, what we're losing through sweat and urination and so on. And then lastly, just to point out here, the, the component of aging. This is more of an anatomical function uh, where our vessels have a certain amount of compliance. They have some elastic tissue and collagen and so on. So for instance, when our heart can, or our left ventricle contracts and ejects blood into the aorta, the aorta is very elastic and will actually expand in response to that. So a lot of the energy, um, a lot of the energy from that forceful contraction is actually dissipated inside that stretch or the, elast um, or the elasticity of that aorta. But over time, we can lose that elasticity. And, you know, as we age, what ends up happening is the, the arteries can become more rigid and stiffer. And we're not able to dissipate a lot of that energy, and so that can actually uh, turn out to turn into an increase in our, our blood pressure when every time the heart contracts, for example. So it's very common to see elderly with an elevated systolic pressure and a lower diastolic pressure, and what we call a, a wide pulse pressure, which is the difference between that systolic and that diastolic number there. All right. So this is really just to kind of impress on you that this regulation of blood pressure 
there has so many different control points and it really it involves a neuroendocrine and renal system type function all right and to quickly point out before i move on is understand that even if we have issues with say you know sympathetic nervous system and an increase in heart rate and contractility uh, or uh, even mediators that uh, may have been increased to to elevate our blood pressures uh, the they usually can't maintain a high blood pressure level as long as the kidneys are perfectly healthy the kidneys are really sort of the uh, the be all end all when it comes to deciding where the blood pressure is going to, to reside because it has its function um, is to basically adjust the volumes as necessary to get you to the to the normal working point again so if the kidneys aren't functioning well then the blood pressure regulation can be very out of whack so to speak Okay, so on this slide, I really just want to talk about uh, how to take a, a blood pressure appropriately. Okay, understanding that there will be situations where this can't always be done in the ideal, um, in the ideal fashion, but it should usually be strived for when, whenever you can. So this is taken from the American Heart Association. You can see it's steps one through six and so on. And so the idea here is to make sure when you get the patient in the room, you know that you don't take the blood pressure right away. Wait about five minutes or so. Let them relax. Okay, because they, they may have walked over there, um, you know, and, and they may have been, you know, outside having a you know, smoke. They might have been exercising. These are things that can actually offset the blood pressure. So these are things that you should ask about and make sure that there's at least 30 minutes between the time of the, you know, the last time they've had coffee or a cigarette or they were exercising before you take that blood pressure reading. Um, but once you have them in the room, they're relaxed. Most of the time, you just wait five minutes. And then you can take the blood pressure. They should be seated with their feet flat on the floor and their arms relaxed. And then the arms should be supported either by you or by the chair or what have you. All right. And when you put the blood pressure cuff on over the arm, it should be about the level of the heart. Now, um, the cuff, the cuff should be of the appropriate size. And I like this because it actually tells you the different sizes all right, that you can use. It does make a difference in the reading. Okay. Because it could either overestimate or underestimate the, the blood pressure if you don't have the right cuff. Now, um, the method with which you should use is really, ideally, is to inflate the blood pressure cuff while palpating the radial artery until you feel that the radial pulse go away. And then as you record that systolic number, now when you reinflate it, you should inflate, you should inflate it to uh, 20 or 30 millimeters of mercury above that level that you recorded previously. And so that usually gives you the good range, and you can listen now that when you auscultate, uh, you can actually listen for those Korakoff sounds. So the first one indicating the systolic number and then that last one indicating the diastolic number. And you should record in both arms, okay, with the patient relaxed. And then you, what you do is you would take the, you know, use the pressure with the, in the arm that had the higher reading, okay. If you have to do a repeat measure, give the patient a couple minutes before you do a, a repeat measure. Okay, then you should record whatever those numbers are. Tell the patient what you've uh, what you've seen or what you recorded. Okay, and if this is the first time you're seeing this patient, we can't make the diagnosis of hypertension just yet. Um, and I'll give the guidelines for that actually, but generally it's going to take a couple of visits for that. Okay. So if we're going to diagnose hypertension. In our workup on the physical exam, all right, that initial blood pressure, again, is taken in both arms. And actually, you know, an ideal circumstance, you should also be taking it in the legs as well, okay? Either listening to the popliteal uh, fossa there, so the, uh, the artery there, or listening at the ankle. And um, generally speaking, the pressures in the leg should be, should be higher than those uh, found in the arm, okay? So keep that in mind. And... Um, you know, on the first examination, you should be listening, you know, for, for bruise, you know, particularly if, you know, you have a, you know, middle aged or elderly patient. Uh, so this will give us an idea of the health of their blood vessels. And I'll speak more to that in the peripheral arterial disease lecture. Uh, but you also listen to the abdomen. You might hear, you know, renal artery uh, brewy. And so that could be indicative of a stenosis to the kidneys. Point of maximal impulse. Um, you know, this is, this, you know, feeling or palpating for that, that apical impulse there. And I can tell you about maybe prolonged hypertension that this patient might have had that has caused hypertrophy in the heart. And so that PMI shift, shifted laterally. 
Okay, so overall, these, these are important things to be doing on the physical exam to assess overall health, okay? In the, uh, in the office, the blood pressure is measured usually over two to three visits, okay? The space is usually at least one week apart, all right? So in other words, if somebody patient comes in and their blood pressure is 140 over 80 or 140 over 90, all right, we're not going to we're not going to be able to give the diagnosis at this particular juncture yet. What we're going to want to have them do is come back, and then what we'll do is we'll take the averages of these numbers. So it's either two or three visits, and they're spaced apart. Okay, and um, if the average comes out to greater than 130 systolic or greater than 80 diastolic, then we have our diagnosis of hypertension. So again, multiple visits, and we average. Now, ideally, actually, it's better if we can have the patient do home monitoring where they're set up with their own blood pressure cuff and they can measure their blood pressure morning and night for maybe a week. Um, and we can take, you know, we can get a better idea of what their average actually is. And one of the reasons for this is a, something called white coat syndrome, which you might have heard of. About one in five patients has this issue where when they go to the, you know, the, the doctor's office, okay or they're in the clinic they're they're anxious and that increases their sympathetic outputs and their blood pressures can rise and so you might be seeing really uh, an increase in blood pressure when at home their blood pressure is really not it's not that high and so sometimes you know doing home monitoring helps repeat visits might help them relax so you might get a better idea of their average but it's usually overestimated ideally the most ideal situation would be ambulatory uh, blood pressure monitoring where they walk around with this, uh, you know, rig to them, and it takes their blood pressure every 15 to 30 minutes or hour, depending on what, what the settings are, and you get an idea throughout the entire day. And you can do that for 24 hours or longer, depending on what's needed. And it's a it's a great way to get a really accurate estimate. Uh, oftentimes, this may be used if you want to see if the medication is working, so you can also adjust your dosing uh, accordingly. Now, in the initial visit, if the blood pressure is greater than 160 systolic or greater than 100 diastolic, and they have end organ damage, okay, so they're having, you know, uh, angina or they're having some other type of issues, all right, uh, that's that's a diagnosis of hypertension. So if you you do labs and you see that they're having actually kidney kidney dysfunction and their blood pressure is this high, that would be an automatic diagnosis of hypertension just on the first visit. Or if their blood pressure is high enough where it's you know 180 over 110, uh, that's that's an, uh, an automatic diagnosis of hypertension. So what are the consequences of hypertension? Hopefully, if you know you've seen some of the other videos, you have a, a good idea of that already. But increased pressures, all right, cause vascular weakening, particularly at junction sites where there's where there's branching of the vessels, uh, and in smaller, weaker vessels, okay, and uh, so they, they become more prone to rupture and things like aneurysm formation, where it kind of balloons out at those branch points. It can cause vascular scarring and stiffening because what happens, they will, the blood vessels, just like the heart, will undergo uh, hypertrophy. And when that's induced, they become thicker and also less compliant. You do run the risk of increased blood clots and atherosclerosis. And I mentioned that, and I talked in more detail about that in the ischemia video. And that's due to endothelial damage and dysfunction. Tissue and organ damage from blocked or narrowed arteries. Okay, so again, this is really just that ischemia type uh, picture all over again, right? So anything downstream of any blockage is not going to get adequate oxygen or nutrients, and so therefore it would suffer and release mediators that can be very damaging. And then of course that's gonna, you know, hypertension increases afterload which increases the work on the heart. It can stress the heart out and the heart will undergo hypertrophy as a result of that as well. So um, some of the signs and symptoms, and, and I think I've already mentioned this, but for the most part, you know, blood pressure is very insidious and doesn't, it may have no symptoms at all, okay? You may have a patient walk in who's got 150 systolic and 90 diastolic and they have no symptoms. It doesn't mean they don't have, uh, you know, in city sort of chronic damage that's been occurring, it's just not to the level where they're aware of it. Uh, but if they are aware of it, some of the symptoms would be things like headaches, okay? Uh, pulsing and pounding headaches can occur. Uh, epistaxis, so nosebleeds from rupture of little vessels. Uh, dizziness, okay? Flushing of the skin where it gets, it gets red and warm. Uh, 
uh, sweating, blurred vision. Uh, sometimes you'll hear patients refer to something called like a heartbeat in my ears. Uh, and that can be like a pounding sensation. Uh, it can also cause impotence. So they, there's, you know, there are symptoms that can be, signs and symptoms that, that can be a part of hypertension, uh, but not always seen. Okay, so what are the major consequences of arterial hypertension? So if we take a look at this chart, all right, really what it comes down to is we have an increase in afterload and we have arterial damage. So as we know, hypertension damages the arteries. Okay, That high pressure increases the afterload with which the heart has to, to contract against. So let's start with the afterload. So it increases afterload. That, leads, that can lead to left ventricular hypertrophy as a, comp a compensation for that. That hypertrophy, like concentric hypertrophy, which would actually decrease the chamber size can lead to diastolic dysfunction where it's not relaxing very well and ultimately to heart failure. Prolonged, this can also lead to systolic dysfunction where it eventually doesn't contract as well either. We lose that functionality, which can also lead to heart failure. And those would be different types of heart failure, which I review in the heart failure lecture. Now, this is also going to increase myocardial oxygen demand because there's more resistance. Now the muscle has to have a hypertrophy and that's gonna demand more oxygen, so you can have ischemic issues. So we're more at risk for uh, ACS, okay? Acute coronary syndromes or myocardial infarctions and so on. Now in terms of arterial damage, you have the accelerated atherosclerosis, and I, I talk more specifically about atherosclerosis in my ischemia lecture video. But this can affect the coronary vessels, which again would decrease myocardial oxygen supply and lead to things like MIs and angina and so on. Cerebral vessels leading to stroke, aorta, uh, leading to things like aneurysm, okay, because the atherosclerosis can actually weaken the wall. And uh, also dissections, where you have the intima separating from the media of the arteries. And I'll talk about that in a separate lecture. The weakened vessel walls themselves. Um, you have, let's say if it's the cerebral vessels, you can have a hemorrhagic stroke as opposed to a ischemic stroke where these vessels are actually rupturing and bleeding out. Uh, if it's happening in the kidneys, these renal vessels, you have nephrosclerosis and uh, renal failure can ensue. And then if it happens to the ophthalmic vessels, it can lead to retinopathies. So you can kind of see that uh, based on this, really three of the organs that we're concerned a lot with when it comes to uh, hypertension is the brain, the kidney, the heart. And uh, I include the eye in there with the brain as well, but we look at the eyes as well. So these are things that we're examining when it comes to hypertensive patients. So we look at their eyes, we assess their heart function, all right, their central nervous system function, and their, their kidney function. So how do we classify hypertension? So really just two classifications. We have uh, primary and secondary. Primary is more commonly referred to as essential. So essential hypertension, which really just means we don't know. We don't know what the underlying cause is. We don't have a specific uh, etiology for it. And that's going to be the majority of the cases and patients that you're going to see, 90, 90 to 95% of them. All right. And it's, it's some combination of genetic factors and environmental causes. So, you know, you may have hypertension runs in your family and uh, you know this particular person also smokes and they drink or what have you and this could also contribute to that uh, secondary would be five to ten percent of the cases and they're really important to kind of figure out um, because uh, this would actually give you an underlying identifiable cause that if treated could actually cure the patient of, of their blood pressure okay of their hypertension i should say not their blood pressure so most common cause is uh, some, some form of kidney disease. So for example, they could have a urinary tract infection, uh, polycystic kidney disease. They could have an endocrine disorder like hyperaldosteronism or you know other, others that I've, I've listed here like sleep apnea, pregnancy, renal artery stenosis. These are all things that are actually correctable, okay? And could actually essentially cure, if you will, their hypertension. So I just put here, just to give you guys an idea of the secondary causes to be aware of these the a b c d e of secondary causes so a stands for apnea or aldosteronism all right apnea sleep apnea okay which you know is a difficulty in breathing uh while they sleep which can actually close close the airway off and um, they usually have increased sympathetic activation because of it all right 
Uh, aldosteronism. You have breweries and bad kidneys. So breweries like renal artery stenosis, bad kidneys because of you know kidney failure or urinary tract infection or something of that nature. C stands for Cushing's or uh, catecholamines, coarcation. Cortisol can increase blood pressure like in Cushing's disease. Uh, catecholamines uh, like a pheochromocytoma, which releases a lot of catecholamines. Uh, coarctation means a narrowing of, so the coarcted um, aorta, for example, coarctation of the aorta would be a narrowing somewhere in the aorta, and I'll speak to that in a little bit. D for drugs and diet, which can cause hypertension. Uh, and then E for excess EPO, or erythropoietin, which can increase the red blood cell and increase viscosity, um, or endocrine is sort of a, a general endocrine uh, issue. So essential hypertension, or otherwise known as primary hypertension, these are just the factors that, that play a role in this. So for example, genetics could run in the family, first degree relatives and so on, so we need to be aware of that. Um, the heart, the heart can have increased sympathetic activity, so it's increasing its cardiac output, heart rate and you know stroke volume and so on. Uh, and actually it's more common with if you have a young person who has high blood pressure, which is uncommon in and of itself, but if you have a young person with high blood pressure, it's usually due more to an increase in cardiac output than it is to an increase in total resistance. The blood vessels, all right, uh, abnormal endothelial responses is an example of that, okay? The kidneys, uh, which regulate blood flow, all right? Um, so their renal blood flow regulation is defective, defective ion channels, so they're not, um, they're not you know, transporting sodium and potassium appropriately, and so water is not being distributed. Uh, the way it should be, and inappropriate hormonal regulation, so elevated renin levels when it shouldn't be elevated. Um, and then others would be things like obesity and diabetes, which are sort of very broad umbrellas um, for uh, causing essential hypertension because it, it, it can have you know several different reasons for causing it. Uh, so for example, obesity, adipose tissue can release uh, angiotensinogen, and which falls into that renin angiotensin uh, pathway. So preserving volume that way. Increase in body size, hold on to more water, so there's more volume. Uh, diabetes, for example, uh, insulin itself can activate the sympathetic nervous system. It can also increase uh, the amount of hypertrophy that occurs in the smooth muscle cells of the walls. And so there's you know, other factors that play into why these diseases may be causing these issues with uh, blood pressure. And then over here in this cartoon, it's just going through each of those. So here, as an example, a blood vessel, if the endothelium is dysfunctional, you know, nitric oxide goes down, endothelium production, which increases uh, vasoconstriction, would go up. Uh, and then there's some others here you can read. But then structurally, uh, you might have exaggerated medial hypertrophy. Okay, so that just means the smooth muscles are hypertrophied more so than they should be. Central nervous system, you may have an increased basal sympathetic tone. All right, abnormal stress responses and, uh, you know, bowel receptors might be more sensitive. Pressure volume receptors, like those bowel ones, they might be desensitized as well, so they're not responding appropriately, ultimately. And then, the, you know, the adrenal glands overproducing catecholamines or, you know, cortisol levels, kidneys and the hormones and so on. Okay, so in secondary hypertension, to compare it to essential hypertension. Essential hypertension, it, you know, this is blood pressure that has some familial component to it that comes on gradually, usually after the age of 20. Um, and then you know, we see more and more of it usually in the, by the age of 30, 40, into 50s and 60s and so on. But when it comes to secondary, there will be some clues that help us differentiate it from this essential hypertension. First off, in the age, if somebody, or if there's a patient that's, you know, younger than the age of 20 or older than 50, who is previously normal tensive, who is now coming in hypertensive, that's usually a clue. Uh, blood pressure will typically rise more dramatically, okay? And if on physical exam you see certain specific signs, like you're listening to the abdomen and you hear uh, what sounds like, a, you know, a renal artery brewery, all right? That could mean that there's some stenosis there. What does that mean in terms of, you know, affecting blood pressure? In renal artery stenosis, it's reducing blood flow to the kidney. If the kidney perceives less flow, it assumes that there's less volume in the body and will then release hormones like the renin angiotensin aldosterone uh, to increase 
blood volume and constrict blood vessels to help elevate blood pressure. This kind of works against us in this case because it's going to elevate blood pressure when it may not be necessary except for the fact that it will increase perfusion to the kidney by driving up that blood pressure. Uh, also, you could examine them for UTI and follow those symptoms accordingly. Uh, family history is typically sporadic in these cases. Now, what I've written over here are the common initial tests that you can do as a workup for anybody with hypertension. Okay, it's, this would be for essential or secondary. A urinalysis. Okay, if you do a urinalysis, you can actually check for volume and see, uh, you know, if they're producing uh, urine or not and the level to which they're producing. Because if they're conserving volume, usually the urine output would decrease. Serum, creatinine, and BUN levels would be an indicator of uh, kidney failure. Serum potassium levels will help you look uh, for maybe a possible hyperaldosteronism. Remember, aldosterone reabsorbs sodium and water comes with it and it secretes potassium. And so if they have you know, low, low potassium levels, they might have high aldosterone levels. Serum glucose levels, um, and microalbuminuria would actually be indicators of things like diabetes, okay, serum cholesterol, HDL, and triglyceride levels uh, as an overall assessment of their, their risk in terms of their uh, atherosclerosis um, risk factors and so on, which would also give you an indicator of the health of their vessels. The ECG uh, would help you to, say, look at something like left ventricular hypertrophy the hypertrophy that's caused because of the increase in absolute load from chronic hypertension. So this is useful because if um, you get a patient and you're diagnosing them as hypertensive, but you don't know how long they've been hypertensive, if the ECG or echo, for example, are demonstrating hypertrophy, then it's been long enough to cause um, changes, right? So now I've already mentioned some of the causes for secondary hypertension, but I just wanted to review a couple things. Uh, you could have an exogenous causes for their hypertension, so they might be a smoker, so smoking cessation would obviously be treatment, reducing alcohol intake. Um, oral contraceptives actually might be one that people don't always think of, but what happens is an increase in estrogen uh, induces the liver to produce more angiotensinogen, which is the precursor to angiotensin. Okay? Uh, renal causes, they could have some sort of parenchymal disease. Um, they could have renal artery stenosis, which I mentioned in the previous slide. And I did, if you recall, mention coarctation of the aorta on the previous slide, and I will go into this in more detail in a separate lecture, but I want to just point out this because this uh, chest x right here is actually showing you coarctation of the aorta. Now, if we look at these different colored arrows, yellow, blue, and green, you'll notice that if I, it's showing you kind of what looks like it bulges out, goes in again, then bulges out again. And if we look at that, what I just drew there, it kind of looks like the number three. They call it the three sign. What happens here is coarctation is a narrowing of a portion of the aorta. The most common site is on the descending thoracic aorta. Okay. Now this is just after the aortic arch. So the yellow arrow is really showing you sort of the, the arch. Okay. And then it's the blue arrow showing where the coarctation is occurring. And so why this causes uh, increase in blood pressure is because of this. The, if we were to take blood pressure in the upper extremities, you would see elevated blood pressure there, but then a decrease in blood pressure in the lower extremities. And so the reason is the blood going through the uh, aortic arch can actually move through the branch of the aortic arch, which feed the upper extremities in the head. But by the time it goes to the descending portion, there's enough resistance there where it doesn't go down to the lower extremities effectively because it's pinched off by that coarcted area. And uh, so what ends up happening is you end up with a lower flow to the lower extremities. And normally, lower extremities should have a higher blood pressure than the upper extremities. Now, if this is chronic and this is persistent, okay, I should say, or it goes undiagnosed, what can happen is what these arrows are indicating over here is you get blood moving through smaller vessels that travel or these arter arteries that travel just underneath the ribs. And as they expand just underneath the ribs, it can actually cause a little bit of erosion of the ribs themselves, and they call that uh, notching of the ribs. So you can see rib notching. If you take a look closely, especially at this arrow over here, you can see just underneath the rib there, okay? You can see it kind of looks like it's not smooth anymore. It looks like it's been kind of chewed up a little bit, and that's rib notching. So that three sign and the rib notching is, is an, in, you know, an indicator for a coarctation of the aorta. And we'll get into more detail a little bit later.
the endocrine. So I mentioned these, some of these already. Pheochromocytoma uh, with elevated catecholamines, adrenocortical hormone excess, so like cortisol, and uh, thyroid hormone. So increase in thyroid hormone can increase you know, heart rate and cardiac output and so on, as well as uh, resistance. Okay, so the treatment for hypertension uh, is both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic. In terms of the non-pharmacologic, you have weight loss and exercise are two sort of cornerstones. Uh, weight loss, for example, if you were to be able to lose um, about 10 kilograms, it's been shown that uh, you can have a drop in your systolic of anywhere from 5 to 20 millimeters of mercury, which is significant. In terms of diet, uh, salt restriction, um, salt restriction may help in some cases. Uh, they found that about 50% of the patients uh, may have trouble regulating their salt intake. For most uh, most healthy individuals, increasing you know salt in their diet will just be excreted by the healthy kidneys. But in some of these hypertensive patients, they found that you know a certain percentage of them, like I said, about 50% or so, will have difficulty regulating that that sodium, and so salt restriction may be useful. Uh, increase in the potassium intake. What they found is that in some patients who have been hypokalemic, that it's been associated with hypertension, and so supplementing. Uh, potassium in those cases may, uh, may be beneficial. Decreased alcohol intake, uh, decreased caffeine intake, uh, smoking cessation, relaxation therapy uh, to reduce your sympathetic output or your anxiety. Uh, all these have been shown to, to be useful and will be added to any patient with hypertension to help, uh, to help out um, our approach to reducing their blood pressure. Okay, so now let's talk about the pharmacological treatments for hypertension. Um, so as you can see, I, I drew out over onto the right side there. I'll explain that. Um, I'll kind of go through that whole path. But this is keeping in mind uh, what I spoke about on an earlier slide with everything that regulates blood pressure, you know, the cardiac output, the total peripheral resistance, the volume, and so on. Because understanding that will make all the rest of this fairly logical. And in fact, when we... We treat, we usually use treatments in four categories, diuretics, which affect the volume, sympatholytics, which uh, essentially blocks sympathetic activations, all right, vasodilators like calcium channel blockers, something that's going to cause di dilation and reduce resistance, and then something that's going to affect uh, volume and resistance like the renin angiotensin aldosterone uh, inhibitors, okay. Now, I mean, I put first line, second line, but the reality is, um, you know, you may, you may use some from either category, depending on the type of patient that you're working with. And I'll explain that a little bit more uh, in a few minutes. But let's talk, take a look at the, the first line as, as our example. So they talk about diuretics. So some examples of diuretics would be thiazides, like hydrochlorothiazide is a classic one. Um, loop diuretics that act on the loop of Henle in the kidney. Uh, potassium sp uh, sparing diuretics like spironolactone. And their main goal is to reduce volume. Okay, so in fact, let me draw that over here. All right, so that would be, diuretics would be useful over here. Diuretics, okay. And I drew that there, so let me explain this chart real quick to you. So this is showing you all the things that make up or regulate blood pressure, right? So at the top here, this is blood pressure. And we know about the cardiac output and the peripheral resistance. I just put PR there for peripheral resistance. And the cardiac output is made up of the heart rate and the stroke volume, as you guys know. The stroke volume, I just broke down stroke volume a little bit more for you. So stroke volume is made up of how contractile that is. So that's you know carried out by some of the sympathetic activation of the heart. Um, and the venous return. So VR stands for venous return. So how much blood is returning to it? So what effect of venous return is the blood volume. So I mentioned this on the earlier slide. Blood volume and the venous tone. Re recalling that when the veins constrict, that actually moves blood back towards the heart. All right. So in terms of overall blood volume in this, in this sort of pathway, diuretics will reduce blood volume, which is going to reduce venous return. Reducing venous return reduces stroke volume. Stroke volume reduces the cardiac output, and that can help reduce the blood pressure. So that's how that's related. Over here, just to, to go over the rest of it, is the peripheral resistance. There's going to be circulating regulators. So that's going to be things like angiotensin II, um, you know, nitric oxide and some of these other things that can that can occur in the blood uh, stream itself, and also the innervation. So that's really talking about the sympathetics again. Okay, so let's look at another one. 
if I have the ACE inhibitor, so ACE inhibitors are our common first line, all right, ACE inhibitors, as well as ARBs, since they're this, essentially uh, very similar to one another. But ACE inhibitors, what they're going to do is they're going to block the renin angiotensin uh, aldosterone pathway by lowering the amount of angiotensin II that's actually produced by inhibiting the ACE enzyme. Now, most of these in this, this, uh, this group of, or this family of medications, they end with the uh, pril. So if you see pril, like captopril, for example, for example, lisinopril, these are ACE inhibitors, okay? Sartans, so if they end in a sartan, like low sartan or valsartan, those are ARBs. And their job is to basically decrease vascular resistance because they angiotensin II can directly cause vasoconstriction, as well as reduce volume because they also induce uh, aldosterone release as well as ADH release, which are both directly involved in volume uh, increase. So we block that, right? So if we look back at our, our path over here, um, that would be part of the peripheral resistance category, right? So ACE inhibitors, so circulatory regulators. So we're inhibiting angiotensin II, which would be under that category, okay? Uh, it could also affect things like venous tone and so on, so that would decrease venous return and stroke volume, so we're affecting peripheral resistance as well as the cardiac output. Calcium channel blockers. So in calcium channel blockers, all right, many of them, uh, the ones that affect the blood vessels primarily and not the heart, usually end in what I call the ipines. Um, amlodipine, okay, is an example of that. Uh, the ones that would affect have more effect on the heart in terms of its contractility and heart rate and so on would be verapamil and deltiazem. Okay, they're going to decrease vascular resistance. Okay, because the calcium channel blockers block calcium from entering into the, the smooth muscle cells, so that would fall into our decreasing peripheral resistance there. Okay, and also affecting the heart's cardiac output via heart rate and contractility. The second line agents, uh, ones like beta blockers. Beta blockers are not great agents for lowering blood pressure, generally speaking. However, they can be very beneficial in a patient who, say, you know, has um, systolic heart failure. You know, where we know that it can be very beneficial there, uh, especially if it's like stable heart failure, uh, or after a patient's had an MI. And so there, where you know you're lowering mortality and it has the added benefit of lowering blood pressure, and so it can decrease heart rate contractility and vascular resistance as well okay in addition we have uh, alpha-1 antagonists often those are referred to as zosins and I'm sorry the beta blockers olols are common uh, ending for them o-l-o-l -O -L, like metoprolol for example alpha-1 uh, antagonists would uh, block the alpha-1 receptors in the peripheral vascular tree and result in vasodilation there's also central alpha-2, so alpha-2 agonists. Uh, one of the classic examples of that is clonidine, and that actually decreases sympathetic tone from the brain, so there's decreased sympathetic tone outward. That's why we call it central acting, so it acts on the brain receptors, and decreases overall tone, but it could have a lot of side effects in doing so, so it's not usually a first-line agent. Um, the alpha-1 antagonist, on the other hand, is not usually first-line because diuretics have been shown to actually have a better outcome uh, profile. Direct renin inhibitors, um, so there's an example here, uh, which can actually decrease salt retention and vascular resistance uh, by decreasing renin and its associated hormones. All right, so in all, really what it comes down to is this. When you're treating this with uh, any kind of medication, you have to also take into account any other issues that may be going on. And I kind of alluded to this already when I talked about the beta blockers in that if they have some form of heart failure or they've had a myocardial infarct or anginal type pain, then a beta blocker as an anti-ischemic and anti-hypertensive would be a really good choice. Uh, ACE inhibitors are a very good choice too, both because they lower mortality in, in heart failure, for example. Uh, they also you know, can lower mortality in ischemic, uh, in ischemic patients. And uh, people with you know, kidney disease or kidney failure uh, benefit from uh, ACE inhibitors. So, you know, this would be a, a population of patients that, you know, would also benefit. Um, now, you know, in terms of diuretics, the, the classic ones to start with usually is a diuretic. Hydrochlorothiazide is usually the first go-to uh, in most cases. And the reason being is it's it's been used for so long, so it's kind of like a tried and true kind of thing, 
uh, and it's also very cheap and it's it's fairly effective it works very well in the population that's most affected which is the non-hispanic black population so it works fairly well for them and so it, it's usually uh, part of the regimen in the beginning uh, and so the way this works you know and i hate to say like it's a plug and play but you know, you're taking into account all the different features of your patient uh, and you can try you know using you know, small doses of one medication and then upping the dosage as needed you know as you, as you measure or monitor their blood pressure and then um, you know oftentimes many patients need to add a second agent because they're on multiple drug uh, regimens as you'll see and the reason for that uh, is is like this if for example I give a vasodilator to a patient who's hypertensive what that can do is that can actually lower perfusion to the kidney. That reduced perfusion then is going to cause the kidney to compensate by increasing hormones that regulate volume and increasing volume and then offset any effect that, that the vasodilator would have given me. So when we add a, a second drug, we add it from a different class that has a different blocking mechanism of action. Right? So for example, I might have a vasodilator and I might not want I might want to use something that also blocks angiotensin too. So maybe you know an, an ACE inhibitor or something like that, or a diuretic and an ACE inhibitor, but something where I'm getting two different mechanisms being approached so that I can offset any compensation that might occur. And so this is from the American Heart Association. You can review this, but if we just quickly go through a couple couple of them. Normal blood pressure over here, right, 120 over 80 or less than 120 over 80. Basically, promote lifestyle, good lifestyle habits, and you know, check up on them again in, the, in their their you know annual physical. However, if we're in that elevated zone, all right, 120 to 129 systolic, it's just non-pharmacological therapy. We're really just trying to catch people early on and try to you know get them to actually start working on healthier habits diet and exercise are the things that I've mentioned previously, all right? And then what you want to do is have them follow up a little bit sooner, maybe in three or six months, okay? Now, stage one, this is where we're entering to a little bit of a gray area, okay? Once we get to stage one, which is a systolic of 130 to 139 or a diastolic of 80 to 89. Um, so now it's the question is, well, you know, do I start medications or not? Because for all these cases, you're always going to have non-pharmacological uh, intervention. You're always going to tell them to, you know, uh, promote optimal lifestyle habits, right? So what it comes down to is this, we're gonna use a, a risk calculator, all right? So we've seen this before, like when we talked about the ischemia and so on, uh, when, we, when we need to know when we're in a gray zone, we wanna stratify, risk stratify this group of patients that fall in this category. And so I've listed it down here, it's the ASCVD, which is the arteriosclerotic cardiovascular disease uh, risk estimator. And so what happens is it's going to ask, you know, it asks a whole bunch of different questions that you fill in. You can actually look at this online and try it out for yourselves, but you don't need to memorize it for this class. But what it can do is it can estimate the 10-year cardiovascular disease risk. And if that 10-year cardiovascular disease risk is greater than 10%, then they're in a higher risk category. And so that goes this way. So we say, yes, okay, it's greater than 10%. I'm going to start medications as well as lifestyle uh, management, okay? And then I, once that's done, I have to reassess that patient to make sure that the medications are wor working. I have to make sure I'm dosing them appropriately and, and monitoring the blood pressure. So I'm going to have closer follow-ups, like three to six months, particularly in the beginning when I need to see how these medications are working for them. Okay. And also to make sure that they're adhering to the medication. However, if their risk is less than 10%, then you can go non-pharmacological only and just increase or, you know, have close follow-up. In stage two, that means systolic greater than 140, um, you know, high diastolic greater than 90, for example. Uh, this would be pharmacologic and non-pharmacological intervention every time. And so, in this case, you know, you're just going to, you know, reassess, you know, and uh, once you start the medication, you want to reassess to make sure the medication is working, as I've mentioned before, and then also finally, um, you know, have close follow-up with them as well. This is a question for you guys to take a look at. So you can pause this at this time and kind of and go through it. Okay, so what I want to do now is move on from just general uh, hypertensive approach to one that is more urgent, like a hypertensive crisis, and what we do in this scenario. So we categorize this as an urgency or an emergency. And uh, the reason we differentiate the two is because we will treat them differently. Now, in an urgency, 
all right this is a severe but asymptomatic hypertension where the systolic is greater than 180 millimeters of mercury uh, and or the diastolic is greater than 120 and there is no signs of end organ damage so that's key so this person is asymptomatic but the blood pressure is very elevated okay so they're at risk but we're not seeing any damage as of yet this is differentiated from an emergency where they're symptomatic and there is signs of end organ damage now you'll notice i didn't give a specific blood pressure for that because it's it's actually just relative if we see that they're symptomatic and there's end organ damage uh, then it doesn't matter what the blood pressure is this is still considered a hypertensive emergency uh, so again this is usually it could be elevated to 160 180 what have you but if we see any end organ damage then that classifies it as an emergency now uh, in terms of end organ damage things that we can do to assess for that would be um, you know checking like a, a urinalysis and the serum BUN and creatinine for for kidney injury uh, if we're evaluating the brain right to CNS central nervous system you can as you're evaluating the pa patients you might find out that they're you know encephalopathic so they could have hypertensive encephalopathy where they're confused or obtunded um, or minimally responsive if you check a look at the eyes right so when we look at the ophthalmoscope you can see uh, papilledema for example which is what we're seeing here in this image over here where you can see the optic disc is, is swollen so here's the optic disc you can see the swelling around there okay and that could be due to you know increased intracranial pressure so you can do a ct and mri and so on to also assess the the brain cardiac ischemia okay so in the case of cardiac ischemia you can also do an ecg so this and also you know do labs like troponins and ckmbs and so on then these would all help give you the picture of uh, if there's any kind of end organ damage that's occurring now in terms of evaluating uh, a hypertensive emergency okay uh any kind of head injury in the history right uh, motor vehicle accidents and they have head injuries or sporting injury or what have you okay uh, that can cause swelling in the brain uh, it can also cause a, a cushing's reflex which if the swelling goes up uh, high enough that can reduce blood flow to the brain because it's an enclosed space and so to compensate for that you get a very large sympathetic output from the brain to drive up the cardiac uh, output and also to cause a lot of uh, constriction of the vessels to drive up the blood pressure to increase perfusing pressures to the brain All right it could be focal or neurological uh, problems okay uh, because you could have you know small blo small blood vessel ruptures um, which might give you you know more of a focal sign retinal examination as I mentioned before chest pain I mentioned dyspnea again if they're you know having you know angel type pain and they're going to some sort of uh, heart failure for it you could also have shortness of breath that's associated with that uh, not to mention that if the tissue itself is ischemic and there's a buildup of things like lactic acid and so on that can also give the person the, the feeling of uh, feeling fatigue and short of breath pregnancy eclampsia or preeclampsia uh, eclampsia uh, is really char uh, characterized by seizures during pregnancy uh, preceding that would be the preeclampsia which is usually you know protein in the urine and uh, high blood pressure drugs so oral contraceptives which I've mentioned the mechanism for that ethanol uh, erythropoietin you have to you know evaluate for their compliance so if they're not taking their medications or they're doing it sporadically and then the tests that I mentioned already to kind of identify the organ damage so hopefully those kind of make sense now looking at that okay so what's our approach now to a hypertensive emergency or an urgency well the, the goal here is not to to drop their blood pressure back into what we consider normal tensive okay so that's very risky so for example less than 120 over 80 you know that's the I, ideal blood pressure right we don't want to take a patient who is usually chronically hypertensive for example and drop them below because they could uh, hypoperfuse their organs and actually become ischemic from that okay because their bodies are used to a much higher pressure now if they're coming in with these very high pressures as like in an emergency for example uh, it's usually it's it's not a good idea to drop their blood pressure too quickly because our goal is not to try to re renormalize them or bring them back to what their normal uh, their normal blood pressure was prior but really to get them out of a risky zone okay and allow their bodies to auto regulate more appropriately okay 
So the idea is this, we want to lower, uh, in general, for an emergency, we want to lower uh, the mean arterial pressure about 10 to 25% in the first one to two hours. Okay, so we want to, again, we want to lower their mean arterial pressure 10 to 25% then lower another 5 to 15% over the next 23 hours. Okay, that allows it, that makes it a little bit slower. So at first, uh, 10 to 25% kind of brings us out of that danger zone. And then once we're in that, that, you know, the back 23 hours there, we can give it more gradually and lower it more gradually and allow the body to adapt um, more smoothly. If in an emergency, if it's severe, like they have hypertensive encephalopathy or their diastolic is greater than 130, that would be severe. You, want, you generally want to treat this with an IV uh, antihypertensive, like nitroprusside, nitroglycerin, labetalol, nicarnapine. These are some of the medications that we can use IV. Uh, and it allows us to you know, titrate accordingly and, and quickly. If, if it's not severe, like they're not showing encephalopathy, for example, or the diastolic is not greater than 130, you, could, you can use oral agents, um, you know, just to making sure that they're in less immediate danger. In an urgency, however, in an urgency, you want to lower the blood pressure um, in 24 hours and you can do it with oral therapy. And use is usually done by usually amping up or increasing the doses of the medications that they're already on with follow-up. Okay. Now, there are some exceptions. So there's, uh, in terms of an emergency, in terms of the pattern with which we low, lower it, if if, on the other hand, they have, let's say, a, an acute uh, ischemic stroke, this is where they we're in a sort of a gray area. Uh, so in an ischemic stroke, generally, it depends on whether or not we want to reperfuse them or not. So I'm not going to go into the details of this because it's unnecessary for this particular topic, but I just want you to recognize there are some ex uh, exceptions to the general rules that I just gave to you. Um, the one I will mention, though, is the aortic dissection. Aortic dissection, again, that's when the intima is removing from the media and you're creating essentially a false lumen. And it can be very dangerous because that can actually cause occlusion uh, and it can cause tamponade and so on. And I'll get into more details on this in a different lecture. But the, the idea here, though, is to lower the blood pressure very quickly and get them to surgery. So this is where, uh, in this case, we want to drop the blood pressure to less than 120 over 80 regardless, get them into the surgery. So as this is a guideline here, you can see at the top, all right, that high blood pressure, okay? Is there end organ damage or not? That's based on our evaluation, right? If there isn't, this is an urgency. So what you can do is, again, reinstitute or intensify oral antihypertensive medications. 24 hours, follow up. If on the other hand, there's end organ damage, this is an emergency. So this is going to be admitted to the ICU. And these are some of the... Uh, some of the exceptions that I mentioned, which is the aortic dissection, some of the others would be eclampsia, pheochromocytoma. Uh, if you have any of those exceptions, uh, you would follow this path over here. So for example, I mentioned dissection, you would drop it to the cystox to less than 120 over, uh, 120 over 80 and uh, get them into surgery. On the other hand, if they do, don't have one of those exceptions, um, you know, ischemic stroke, dissection and so on, then you'd follow the pattern that I talked about previously, which is lowering at a maximum of 25% in the first hour or two, and in the next 23 hours, 10 to 15%. Okay, so now we want to talk about hypotension, right? By definition, though, with, with hypotension, really it's, it's an absolute definition of if the systolic blood pressure is less than 90, which would just not be enough uh, pressure to perfuse organs adequately. Uh, or it could be relative. And relative means it's just is greater than 40 millimeter, 40 millimeters of mercury drop from where they usually uh, are. So, for example, if they're at 150 millimeters of mercury and they drop 40 and they're at 110, 110 is not less than 90, but relative to where they were, that is going to be hypoperfused for them, and they could become ischemic from that and symptomatic. All right. Now, uh, orthostatic hypotension. So this is sort this is what happens when there's a drop in blood pressure. Uh, either right after a meal or usually upon changing position. So going from a seated to a standing position or from lying down to a, to a standing position. And so uh, by definition, that's a drop in the systolic blood pressure of greater than 20 or a diastolic greater than 10 when they stand. Okay. 
This has to do with an impaired autonomic reflex. All right. Under normal circumstances, if we were to lie down and then stand up, as we're lying down, there's good venous return to the heart because the heart's at the same level as the lower extremities. So the cardiac output is good. As we stand up, the cardiac output uh, transiently decreases because blood is pooled into the lower extremities all right, due to gravity, which lowers our stroke volume and can decrease our cardiac output, at least temporarily. The autonomic reflex kicks in very quickly, can increase you know, your, your heart rate and so on, and that helps to bring your cardiac uh, your cardiac output back up, and we can also, you know, change our our resistances as well, and this happens very quickly. However, most commonly this occurs in the elderly, and it's because their bowel receptors are desensitized. Okay, so their autonomic reflex is not as quick. They may have carotid stenosis. So if they have stenosis of the carotids, they have hypoperfusion of the brain generally anyway. Um, and then medications. They're on medications, they might be on a beta blocker or something like that that's you know lowering their, their heart rate, for example, already, and so they may be more prone to this. And so what we can do is we can actually treat this by offering suggestions of, you know, obviously you know, be careful as they're as they're rising from a seated position or a lying position, take their time. Uh, make sure there's a railing nearby, maybe. Uh, if it's medication induced, we could you know adjust medications uh, as needed. Carotid stenosis, you can work, you can talk about things like stents and risk modifications of atherosclerosis and so on. All right. Uh, so another severe form of uh, hypotension would be shock. All right. So shock uh, is hypotension is causing end organ hypoperfusion. Okay. So this is going to be causing ischemia of these organs. And this is a medical emergency. Right. Now, in cases of hypotension, all right, I put over here. Uh, what the compensations for hypotension are. So things to look out for in your patients. They would become tachycardic in most cases, okay, as it tries to increase the cardiac output to make up for the, the drop in the blood pressure. There's uh, decreased urinary output, typically, because you're trying to conserve volume to maintain blood pressure. Tachypnea, so tachypnea, again, being ischemic and not getting the oxygen you need would drive up your respiratory rate. All right, so we'll be breathing a little bit faster. Confusion, all right, uh, they can be confused if it's severe, all right, so you're not perfusing the brain. Cool and pale or warm and flushed skin. So it could be either or, and I'll kind of get into this uh, in a little bit with some of the examples, but cool and pale could be because it's very constricted, so it makes it cold, so you don't have a good blood flow to those areas, all right, and so that's would also be pale. Or it can be warm because it's incredibly vasodilated. Okay, so I'll, I'll go into examples of those. Okay, so we're going to discuss shock now. And shock, there are several types. Cardiogenic, hypovolemic, vasogenic, slash distributive, and obstructive. And although the, the underlying issue is uh, hypotension that leads to underperfusion of organs, uh, which can cause end organ damage, um, the the mechanism of and the treatments for each of these would actually differ from each other. Okay, so cardiogenic, for example, would be a failure of the pump. So it's not actually contracting uh, enough to keep up the cardiac output to a level which would be perfusing the organs appropriately. Okay, and so we've seen that when I talked about the heart failure lecture. Hypovolemic would be a low volume status that can occur because you're bleeding out from a hemorrhage, you're dehydrated. All right, not taking in enough fluids, or let's say that person's a burn, a burn victim. Okay, vasogenic or distributive. Vasogenic is really referring to the 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 loss in peripheral resistance. From neurogenic, septic, or anaphylactic, the result is in these cases where you have massive vasodilation. Neurogenic, for example, classic uh, example of that would be spinal cord injury. All right, so spinal cord injury, which essentially inhibits the release of any sympathetic output and causes massive vasodilation due to loss of sympathetic tone. Septic would be due to some sort of toxins released from an infection. Uh, anaphylactic, okay, this would be more of these sort of like uh, objects that are uh, producing an antigenic response. And the result would be vasodilation, massive vasodilation. Okay. Obstructive would be anything that inhibits the, the flow of, of the blood. Um, you know, any kind of decrease in cardiac output. So, for example, a massive pulmonary embolism, uh, a pneumothorax, tamponade, so, you know, fluid accumulating around the heart, compressing it so it's not able to function appropriately. 
And so you can see just from describing some of these, the treatments would be different, right? So for example, if, the, if you describe somebody who's undergoing vasogenic shock, you would, and uh, you know, they have a fever, and they have a you know, site of infection, then you're looking at what looks like septic, right? Septic shock. Um, whereas, you know, if you had something with tamponade, this is, you know, muffled heart sounds. And we'll talk about tamponade more specifically in another lecture, but, you know, we would insert needles and remove the fluid and the heart itself might otherwise be normal. So there'll be different treatments for some of these. But the importance is really knowing which one we're dealing with, okay? And so if we look down here at the chart, this gives an example of at least the three types, at least three types, hypovolemic, cardiogenic, and distributive, or what I've also referred to as vasogenic, okay? And we really categorize the shocks based on these criteria up here, the preload, the cardiac output, and the afterload, okay? So changes in those variables will actually give us the information we need to make the diagnosis. So how do we measure preload? Well, in these cases, all right, we put in the catheter and we have what we call the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And I've discussed that actually on the, the first video. So the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, this will indirectly measure changes in pressure to the left side of the heart or the left atrium uh, and the diastolic pressures in the left, in the left ventricle. Okay, which gives us an, an idea because if volume goes up, pressures go up, volume goes down, pressures go down. So it gives us an idea of the volume status. We can also measure cardiac output with those catheters as well. And so we can see that changing uh, in real time. And the systemic vascular resistance or the afterload, which can also be measured as well. All right, so we take a look here. Uh, hypovolemic shock, so low volume status, let's say dehydration or something of that nature, right? Low volume means low uh, venous return, low, pre low preload. So the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure would go down because there's a low volume, low pressure. The cardiac output would go up as a compensation for, okay? Because if the you know, stroke volume goes down, the heart rate can go up and maintain the cardiac output. The systemic vascular resistance or the afterload would generally go up as a compensation, okay? Keeping in mind, again, blood pressure equals cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. So total peripheral resistance would go up uh, and the cardiac output would be, would be trying to maintain with an increase in heart rate. Okay, that would help to maintain overall our blood pressure here. How would I treat that? Things like IV fluids, right? Because they're dehydrated. Cardiogenic shock, failure of the pump. This means that we're retaining fluids. We're not being able to pump it out effectively out of the heart because it's not contracting well. So you would actually expect an increase in volume in the heart because it's not able to pump it out. So the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure would be increased in this case, okay? The cardiac output, however, would be decreased because we're not contracting sufficiently, okay? We may not be able to get a good adequate heart rate either. And so the cardiac output would go down. The, uh, the compensation for that would also be to increase the systemic vascular resistance to try to maintain that blood pressure. Okay, so you'd expect that to go up here. All right. Now, in distributive shock or septic or neurogenic shock, okay, uh, what you could see is a decrease in preload because what you have here is massive vasodilation, which means the veins are vasodilated as well as the arteries. Okay. And so if the veins are vasodilated, that means poor venous return, poor preload, and so that can be decreased. Cardiac outputs uh, can be increased if it tries to compensate with an increase in, in heart rate and contractility and so on. And then the vascular resistance, of course, would be decreased in this case because of the toxin or because of the decrease in sympathetic tone and so on. And so the red arrows are kind of showing you here across the board, kind of indicating what the primary uh, insult is all about here. Okay, hypovolemic would be a loss of volume, makes sense, right? Uh, so therefore, a decrease in preload, cardiac output would be decreased because you have a decreased functionality of the heart itself, and then distributed because the vascular resistance is lower. So that's really sort of our primary insult. And now we can actually make the diagnosis, all right? So that's, again, so you see some of the compensatory mechanisms are there. So in pre-shock, we usually can compensate enough to maintain perfusion well enough. So things like tachycardia to maintain cardiac output, uh, oliguria, just referring to the fact that the kidneys are gonna retain volume and so on, all right? 
However, once we get into shock, shock just means we're basically overwhelmed. The compensatory mechanisms are not able to meet the demand that's there. And you end up in a vicious cycle where you're making the heart work harder to meet the demand, but the heart itself starts to fail as well. All right, and this leads ultimately to end organ dysfunction. So specifically, if we're just talking about cardiogenic shock, all right, this is a uh, state of tissue hypoxia due to reduced oxygen delivery, right, in the presence of normal vascular volume. Okay, the volume hasn't decreased, it's not hypovolemic, all right. We don't have vasogenic shock here. This is a, a failure of the pump, so cardiac output would be decreased. Okay, and I've actually mentioned this in the heart failure lecture, and you can review that again. But this is wet versus dry, cold versus warm. Okay, having to do with the fact that if they're wet, you listen to the lungs, for example, you can hear crackles because fluid's backing up. You might see distended neck veins, okay? Versus dry when you wouldn't see any of those symptoms. And cold and warm, referring to the peripheral vessels. So cold, if they're very vasoconstricted, due as a compensation for the lack of cardiac output, they could constrict so much that the patient has very cold extremities due to poor flow there. Uh, or if it's still warm, right? Now, some of the reasons for you know, cardiogenic shock are, as you can see, any number here, but myocardial infarction is one of the most common. Uh, and typically, the myocardial infarct affects greater than 40% of the ventricular wall, okay? Because that's a large enough percentage to really greatly impact the cardiac output. Uh, arrhythmias, which we'll discuss in more detail later, uh, acute heart failures, myocarditis, valvular disorders, aortic dissections, and so on. These can all be contributors, okay? Clinically, things that we'll see in cardiogenic shock, as I've kind of already mentioned already, but a blood pressure would be low, okay? Oftentimes less than 90 millimeters of mercury. The cardiac index, so CI stands for cardiac index. So it's like cardiac output, which is typically anywhere from four to six liters per minute on average. But cardiac index also takes into account the surface area of the patient. Uh, because a larger surface area would usually equate to a larger cardiac output, okay? So uh, cardiac output or cardiac index of less than 2.2 liters per minute per meter squared uh, is uh, insufficient, but it would be a decreased cardiac output. All right, that would be sort of equivalent to like less than four liters per minute. A pulmonary capillary wedge pressure of greater than 18 millimeters of mercury. So what happens is as the heart fails, fluid builds up and remember the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure measures that left atrial pressures if that goes up to about 18 millimeters of mercury that pressure is high enough now to resist flow coming from the pulmonary circulations which pressures don't uh, go much above that and so that can cause stagnation of flow and pulmonary edema and so on okay so in terms of treatment for shock uh, there's some initial uh, steps that can be used as sort of general guidelines. Um, so, for example, establishing a large bore IV um, in case you have to push things like, you know, large volumes of fluid, central lines and arterial lines to make sure you can you know, put in things like the pulmonary capillary wedge pressures, um, you know, give vasopressors. You're going to draw blood, take labs, you're going to do imaging as part of the general workup to find out what, you know, the underlying cause might be, as well as to assess the end organ damage. And you know, put them on a pulse ox to, to measure their oxygenation level. Now that, that goes to about this point here. Then once we get to inotropy, we're talking a little bit more specifically now. In inotropy, something that increases contractility of the heart would be useful in cardiogenic shock, for example, where it's not contracting hard enough. Uh, dopamine, dobutamine would be uh, good medications for that purpose. Now, you know, afterload reduction, so you know, decreasing vascular resistance. It might seem a little counterintuitive in cardiogenic shock, for example, where the person's already hypotensive due to the cardiogenic shock. Um, the idea here, though, is that by yeah, at least quickly reducing the afterload might help uh, move the fluid out of the heart and you know, increase their cardiac output, which would hopefully offset some of that drop in blood pressure. And it would also help to relieve some of the congestion in the lungs and so on. So it could be useful. However, you would not use it though if the systolic blood pressure uh, was less than 90 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so it would be contraindicated in that case. So we wouldn't use it just across the board. We'd have to make sure 
uh, the patient would be able to tolerate it. Uh, again, in vasogenic shock, where they're already very, very hypotensive due to the fact that they're massively vasodilated, you would steer away from afterload reduction, of course. Uh, fluids, okay, so fluids, obviously would give that in something like hypovolemic shock. However, you wouldn't use it in cardiogenic shock because they're backed up with fluids already. Instead, you might consider uh, judicious use of diuretics, being very careful again because they might be hypotensive and you don't want to draw off too much fluid, but maybe enough to help uh, the hearts contract a little bit better and to offload some of the fluid in the lungs. Okay, so again, that would be very careful usage of, of either the diuretics or uh, afterload reduction in cardiogenic shock. But hopefully this is why it's important to differentiate what type of shock you're dealing with because the treatments are going to vary as you can see. Giving you know lots of fluids to hypovolemic versus you know avoiding fluids in a cardiogenic picture. ABCs just to remind you again you know the airway breathing and circulation is something you'll always have to pay attention to since mortality is very high here. Okay always try to treat the underlying cause. You know, if it's an MI, if it's tamponade, if it's arrhythmias, right? Because if it's an arrhythmia, we're gonna try something like uh, defibrillation, for example. Uh, tamponade, a syringe to withdraw fluid from around the heart. If it's sepsis, we're, we're approaching it from the infectious standpoint, right? Um, now, you know, in terms of the cardiogenic shock, you could use uh, an intra-aortic balloon pump as a temporizing measure. And so I'm showing that over here, and I've mentioned this on another video, but I'll just quickly go over it. This catheter is inserted into the arterial system, and as you can see it here, it's on the descending thoracic aorta, and it inflates a balloon and then deflates, and it does that with the cardiac cycle. So what happens is every time the heart contracts, so during systole, it deflates. So you see that during systole is deflated. What happens is as it deflates in time with systole, it can create a little bit of a vacuum. It helps to draw blood out of the heart. And so that can actually improve the cardiac output. And then during diastole, it would reinflate. And what that does is it increases pressure that drives blood peripherally, okay, as well as back towards the heart to improve coronary circulation as well. So it helps the heart out, okay? So lowers that afterload and increases that cardiac output, okay? Now, these patients have to be in the ICU. They'd be monitored with, you know, Swangans catheter, which is really just the type of catheter you could use to measure pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, measure cardiac output, and try to maintain, uh, you know, maintain the cardiac output above four liters per minute, for example. Uh, keep that pulmonary capillary wedge pressure below uh, 18 millimeters of mercury. Uh, in addition, you could also use, you know, a, a pressure uh, reading of the jugular veins. Okay, which would also demonstrate, you know, uh, an increase in pressure if the heart is being backed up. So to finish off, this is just a question for you guys to review, and we will discuss this as well as a case uh, during the live lecture. Good luck.